from sunny St. Leonard's on the south coast of the UK, this is the Keto Woman Podcast, brought to you by me, Daisy Brackenhall. Hello, Keto lovelies, and welcome to episode number 212, where I am joined by my very good friend, Terry Lance. We are going to be talking about time-restricted eating. Now, many of you will be doing this already as part of your daily routine, or maybe you know that you should be doing it as part of your daily routine, or maybe you could narrow that window down a bit, like in my case. As Terry and I will discuss, most of us already consider an overnight fast of 12 to 14 hours as something pretty normal but maybe not, or maybe we could improve on that. If that's the case, then this episode is for you. And if you're a fan of Terry, which I know you all are, well, you'll just enjoy listening to her. This episode in format is a little bit like Monday Mindset. I start off by telling her about an episode of a podcast I listened to really just as a bit of a springboard to enable her to go off talking about all the things she talks about, which as usual are really interesting. But before we get started, I will just do a very quick roundup of my week. As you will know from last week, I've been very focused on getting the Fasting Method podcast out there and tickling your earbuds. I hope you've had a chance by now to listen to the introduction episode, but also probably the first Q&A episode that came out on Tuesday. I've already had some feedback and as I anticipated, you're enjoying it every bit as much as I am. So I've been carrying on working behind the scenes with that, getting it out to all the places where you can listen to it on your podcatchers, working on getting it onto YouTube, even getting some transcripts out there. So it should be available in all the places and in all the formats to make it really easy for you to enjoy it too. Another week, another lack of DIY progress less said about that the better. It has been another perfect week for going in the sea though. So I've had a lovely daily routine of rolling out of bed in the morning, getting my swimming costume on, filling my flask full of coffee and heading down to the beach for a quick dip before I come back and take the dogs out for a walk. Mostly I have to say they behave themselves although we did have a bit of a chewing my reading glasses incident this week, which I wasn't overly impressed by. But for the most part, despite them getting a bit excited when I get up thinking it might be time for a walk, they know now really what my routine is. But the weather and the sea has just been wonderful. Today, I think the wind speed was right down to zero and the sea was perfectly, perfectly calm. It is getting a bit chillier. I must take a thermometer down and see what the temperature actually is. But I've heard reports of it being down in the sort of 12, even maybe 11 degree region. And that's Celsius. I'm not sure what that is in Fahrenheit. You'll have to ask Google. But getting a little bit chilly, but not chilly enough quite yet to switch to my neoprene boots. I was talking to a fellow swimmer the other day and she says she reckons it's going to get down to a very icy three degrees. Now that's really going to be something to take my breath away. But I have to admit, I'm also quite excited about it. So that's it really. Nothing more to report. I'm heading over to Worthing this weekend. It's my sister's 40th birthday and the whole family is coming down and congregating at my mum's place and we're heading out for, I think, a Nepalese meal at a local restaurant. So that's going to be fantastic and I can't wait to get together with the whole family. So for now, let's get back to this week's episode with the very fabulous Terry Lance. Welcome back, Terry, to the Keto Woman podcast. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thanks for having me here, Daisy. 
Well, I thought we would do, it's kind of, and my brain gets a little bit confused as to which cap it is wearing at which time, because we record a fair few different kind of episodes now. But I came across an episode of Michael Mosley's podcast, Just One Thing, but it didn't fit for Monday Mindset but it did fit very well for Keto Woman. I don't think it's really a Mindset Matters episode either, but it is on a very important subject, which you are eminently qualified to speak about. So I really wanted to have you on the podcast to talk about it. And the podcast episode in question was called Change Your Meal Times, and it's all about time-restricted eating. And he is talking about a 12 to 14 hours overnight, quote unquote, fast, which um, certainly I should imagine to quite a lot of the listeners feels quite easy peasy and maybe is something that they take for granted or maybe not. And if maybe not, well, we're definitely speaking to you because potential health benefits. And so I'm just going to talk a little bit about the things that he brought up in the episode. I don't have my usual pages and pages of notes. It's just a page or so. But I thought that would be a good springboard for you to talk about all the things you would like to talk about. Sounds fun. So potential health benefits of restricting your eating window and extending that overnight sleeping fasting time. Improved blood sugar regulation, a big one. You also see improvements with blood pressure, cardiovascular health, brain and mental health, sleep and weight loss and weight regulation. But why does it help these things? He had a guest on called Dr. Emily Manoogian, and she says it should be everybody's norm, not just those who need to improve health problems. And she says it's all about the circadian system. As far as she's concerned, it's the third component of nutrition. So it's just as important as what you eat and how much you eat, when you eat, is very important. Obviously, I don't need to tell you that. <laughs> but so she talks about the circadian system. She says, physiologically and mentally, we are a different person at different times of the day. And this is all coordinated by our circadian system to make sure that everything happens right place, right time. But the problem is modern day living tends to disrupt this system. And chronic disruption leads to an increase in inflammation, blood pressure, weight and diseases. So clearly big potential problem. And she says, and this is a question for you, how important is this? That ideally we should consume most of our calories during the first half of the day try and get eight hours sleep, start eating. And by eating, she includes ideally coffee and tea, but definitely if you put milk or cream in your coffee and tea, she says, ideally, you don't start your eating window until a minimum of one to two hours after you get up and you end it three to four hours before bedtime. And they have a sort of a test subject on this podcast where they get somebody to experiment with the changes they're talking about and see how they get on. And the woman they had on, her particular issue, and I have to put my hands up to this as well, is eating too close to bedtime. They said one of the problems with this there are problems just with eating too close to bedtime. But one of the problems that tends to come along with that is it tends to be sort of more unhealthy, snacky type excess food. I guess it comes into that category. And that's certainly an issue that I have. But why is it such a problem if you eat too close to bedtime? And she says, because sleep is a crucial time for your body to rest and repair. And if you're still digesting, which takes a fair amount of energy, it's going to divert resources from this essential repair time. 
and you can get into all sorts of problems with things like hormone disruption, inhibiting insulin secretion, and you end up with blood sugar storage problems and all sorts of issues. You're basically constantly challenging your system when it should be resting and repairing. So the key takeaway, told you there weren't many notes, that I took from that was that this is so important for everybody. Like I say, it should be everybody's normal way of eating or not eating uh, to limit your eating window and not to eat too close to bedtime. And I'm interested to hear from you how important the waiting a couple of hours before you start eating is and also this idea of trying to eat most of your food in the first half of the day because that's something that I've certainly always struggled with and I'm sure there are lots of other points as well but I thought that was a good starting point. So Daisy, this is, to me, obviously, you know, I'm a subject that I am really excited about, Mm -hmm. very interested in discussing. And as with almost everything you and I talk about, there are so many different views and different ways of approaching it. Some of what she said, I've heard before and am fully behind. And then some things I've heard a little differently from other people. So I'll try to address Mm, some of those. Yeah. So... I think if I'm recalling, based on what you said of her, she works at or is connected with the Salk Institute, which actually is she is just about a half hour away from where I live. Oh, really? That's interesting. Yeah. And I had not heard her talk about this before, but I'm imagining her research partner may be Sachin Panda. Oh, yes, yes. I've heard him speaking on a few podcasts. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I didn't realize they worked together. Interesting. I assume because his research is on the circadian regulation mm. of behavior, physiology, and metabolism. <laughs> so kind of fits. But one of the things I remember him talking about in his research, and it was mice or rats, whatever, and they found great things about even just a 10 hour keeping your food within a 10 hour. So that would be the 14 hour fasted state from last meal of one day Mm. to the next meal the next day. And when someone asked him why that number of hours, he said it was because that's when they could test the rats. Like it just made sense. They weren't going (laughs) to test them later. So they did a 10 hour window because that's when they were there checking things. So I think that's kind of interesting even to know (laughs) that when you look at some science, there are outside reasons why certain things happen that aren't even about the theory that they're really trying to prove. But definitely, I think that everyone, as you said, not only people who are working on improving their health, reversing diabetes, fatty liver disease, those kind of things, or weight loss, but anyone who wants to be healthy and just help their body to be optimized, eating in a more at the fasting method, we just refer to it now as TRE, time-restricted eating, meaning just meals, not snacks, and that you would do that within a certain window of time, that that is really important. A couple of things I would add as I was listening to you talk about the problem with late night eating, which I think for most people has been an issue. And as you said, for many of us, that would be snacking on things and you know, not the healthiest of foods. Most people are not eating broccoli at 11 o'clock at night. (laughs) Even people that probably your audience here who are working on some version of a lower carb ketogenic diet, even if they're eating those foods late at night, it's still very problematic because this is my understanding. And I should let your listeners know my background is as an English teacher. So I take all science from the very, um, what would you say? Lay persons. Thank you. The lay person's approach to science. So I look at it this way and I always share it with clients this way. Our insulin works on our circadian clock and around dinner time, the bell rings, it goes home from work. So the factory shuts down, insulin goes home. It sits on the couch, it's watching a soccer game, it's having a beer, it's relaxing. And then you eat at nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. 
you are calling insulin back into work beyond its work day. Hmm. Now, just imagine. That's a good one. That factory worker. You're not going to be at your best, that's are right. you? That's <laughs> right. The factory worker, one, is probably a little bit annoyed that they're being called back in. Maybe had a glass of wine. That's right. They're slow moving. <laughs> they're not as efficient. And if we really take this analogy to heart, usually if you get called back in, you're going to be on, you're going to get paid time and a half. So they don't have much motivation to work quickly. So insulin usually kind of rises after we eat. And then if we are metabolically healthy, it's pretty much back to where it was within three hours. But if we eat at nine or 10 o'clock at night, it's going to stay on board even longer than that because it's slow moving, it's inefficient, it's getting paid time and a half, it's <laughs> had a beer. So it's not very effective. And as you said from this podcast that you listen to, certainly that interferes with our metabolism at night. It interferes with our body that's supposed to be in a resting state at that point. Instead, it's still in the digestion and mm. using the pancreas and liver at this time when they shouldn't be used for these purposes. Yeah. And they mentioned about you know, things just hanging around in your system yeah. longer than they needed to. Yep. And what you described is exactly why that's happening. Mm -hmm. And so if you even take that then into the bigger picture of just time-restricted eating or eating within a certain time of the day, every time we eat, we cause the liver and pancreas to have to do those jobs. They have other jobs to do as well. And so we're really kind of preventing the liver from fully being able to do its other work when we're in the fed state frequently. I love the analogy because you can play with it. It's like distracting them with Facebook all the time. That's right. That's right. <laughs> it's like, no, I've got a job to do. That's right. Two or three times a day. Yep. Do not distract me the rest of the time yeah. because I've got other stuff to do. That's great. Yeah, exactly. Like I can't stop to do that seven times today. I've done the allotted two to three. I mean, I can stop to do it, but I'm not going to be doing this other stuff. That's right. That's right. And as we know, we are all pretty much indoctrinated now that multitasking is better for us. Multitasking is not really great for the liver. So, um, And it's a myth anyway. That's right. That's <laughs> right. So there's so many reasons why not snacking, not eating frequently is really important. Another area that I have heard some different information about, even than her way of describing the circadian rhythm related to this, and I know this lifestyle-wise doesn't fit for many people and um, just preference-wise doesn't fit. But if you think about our circadian clock, our circadian rhythm, we get a cortisol spike in the morning to wake us up, to get us moving and get us out of bed. And it is influenced by sunlight. And so this starts the circadian clock going, you know, wake you up. So you get some increased glucose. Anyone who has been diagnosed with prediabetes or type 2 diabetes probably recognizes that their blood sugar is higher in the morning. This is normal in that the cortisol spike causes some increase in glucose. And then if you're pretty healthy, your body is going to activate some insulin at this time to manage that glucose. So what a lot of people do when they start, I think especially eating something like a ketogenic diet or a low-carb diet, is they find that they need to eat less frequently. And so they space out their meals. And so maybe they don't start eating until noon, mm. and then maybe they eat again at six. Yeah, that's kind of me, typical. Yeah, yeah. very common um, schedule that you hear. I think of it this way. Around 7 a.m., I had increase in glucose and then insulin to cover it. So some people would propose you're better off to eat breakfast because you've already got that hormone activated. Mm. Otherwise, it's kind of an extra insulin activation throughout the day. So let's say that happens naturally first thing in the morning, and then I eat at noon. So then there's my next one. And then I eat again at six. So that's three times out of the day. And again, far better than the six or seven or eight times if I snack and graze all day. But these people tend to promote the idea that it's better to eat in the morning 
because you've already got the insulin on board. Mm. Use it with the food that you have for breakfast. Then eat a late lunch, like mid-afternoon. Yeah, there's this whole, what is the phrase? Something like breakfast like a king, lunch like a something else, and dinner like a pauper or something. You're supposed to front load. Mm -hmm. I look at it this way. If you're only eating two meals, and you know many of your listeners may be finding that as they're working on lowering their carbohydrates and eating a different ratio of macros than they were used to in the past, if they narrow that down then into two meals a day. Some of the people who talk about eating according to our circadian clock describe that we should eat our first meal. I think they go as soon as within an hour of sunrise Mm -hmm. and that we should be done with our food within eight hours of sunrise. So depending on time of year and where you live, let's say sunrise is at 7 a.m. That means you would be done eating by 3 p.m. And that's actually according to your circadian clock. And we do get another cortisol spike in the late afternoon, which is why some of us have learned to snack around two o'clock, three o'clock in the afternoon. Right. Because we've had an increase in glucose, increase in cortisol. We've had an activation of insulin to kind of cover that, which sets off the cascade of being hungry. So eating first thing in the morning and then that early afternoon slot for a lot of people helps to resolve the later night hunger because your insulin's been used at the appropriate time rather than it lingering around into the evening. So I always suggest to people to work on incorporating this circadian timing if they can. I understand some of us based on family, based on work schedule and things, that's just not even possible. But I think the earlier we can get our food done, the better we, we're doing for our body, for our health, as you said, our metabolism, our sleep, our inflammation levels. So I think there are all kinds of reasons why keeping this in mind and starting to structure our day around this more is a really helpful idea. And then one last thing I'll say about the timing. It's off on a little bit of a tangent, but it's connected here. So beyond the hormone of insulin and Again, I'm I'm guessing most of your listeners are pretty well versed in that because that's partly why they're doing a lower carb or ketogenic way of eating is that another hormone that plays a big role in all of this is leptin. Mm. And leptin is stored in fat and leptin is the hormone that tells us we have enough energy and turns off eating, (laughs) lets us know to stop eating. Well, we become, many of us become leptin resistant similar to becoming insulin resistant. So our body's not getting that signal to stop. The body's not getting a signal that it has enough energy. So people who write about leptin, several that I follow, talk about if you need to reset your leptin, get your body sensitive to sensing leptin again, that it's actually very important to eat very soon after you wake up. Hmm. And they will describe it as within 30 minutes of waking up and a high protein meal. So just kind of dovetails with this whole idea of our hormones are tied to this circadian clock. And when we get up, that's, you know, an important stage in our circadian rhythm. And that's actually a time when eating can be useful. I know that many people, though, for convenience sake, or because they just don't feel very hungry in the morning, they wait and eat later in the day. And I think that's fine if it works for your body. But the idea of still keeping it earlier, I would work on being done by five or six in the evening if possible, giving your body plenty of time to get that insulin taken care of before it's time to go to bed, well before it's time. But If it works in your schedule, moving the hours even earlier can be really beneficial and actually can help manage hunger better. Interesting. Because you're eating when those natural spikes are happening rather than resisting and eating at a later time. And then one last factor that is involved in that for many people is our ghrelin, which is our hunger hormone, is a little quieter first thing in the morning. And this is why a lot of people aren't very hungry in the morning. Mm. 
That's me, yeah. But also think about the fact that your body has already excreted some glucose. It's already fed (laughs) your tissues of it. And so, you know, I think this is why a lot of us aren't hungry. What I've seen some people notice, though, is as they finish their meals earlier, they are ready to eat earlier. Mm, That makes sense. But if you're eating at 10 Mm. o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night, it makes sense that you're not hungry first thing in the morning. And so it's a lot of shifting. It's kind of like... If you are someone who stays up until 2 a.m. and have a hard time getting up in the morning, Mm. you have to shift one in order to affect the other. Oh, that's a really good point. Yeah. Yes, interesting. And there is that kind of mismatch in what she was saying about not starting to eat anything, you know, for one to two hours after you wake up. And then saying to consume most of your calories first half of the day. What I suspect... Is something that you've mentioned a few times is fitting into the typical person's lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what they're getting at with what she's saying, that if you're going to have this window, they're sort of hedging a bit saying, you know, one to two hours after you've got up, three to four hours before you go to bed, Mm -hmm. you know, you can kind of see how that works. So it's really interesting that you've gone into this subject a bit further with tying into the circadian rhythm and moving everything a bit forward if you can and it's there are lots of things that were sort of ringing bells in my head um that yes that makes complete sense to me because it's certainly what i found with sleep Mm -hmm. as anyone who's listened to me (laughs) over the years will know I used to have a real problem with getting up early in the morning and now I don't and naturally yes that that whole sleep and awake window if you like has shifted and I start falling asleep now you know often I'll go to bed at half past nine ten o'clock at night because I'm really tired because you know I'm getting up a lot earlier in the morning and that has all the knock-on benefits Mm -hmm. of tying in with the circadian system and getting light in the mornings and all the rest of it but something that I personally I think I need to shift also is this eating window and I have got a bit better but yes I definitely tend to eat my meal a bit too late and I do have a tendency to snack later as well but that's interesting what you were saying that if I gradually sort of pull try and pull that back a bit earlier and actually this is a perfect time of year Mm -hmm. to be doing it because it gets dark so early here in the UK now you know it's dark by four half past four it's ridiculous so you know by the time you're at half past five six it feels like it's eight nine o'clock at night anyway um so I think it it will be a good time actually to potentially start adopting that habit of eating a bit earlier and yes maybe like you say that will make me in turn make me a bit hungrier earlier in the morning Mm -hmm. you know I like there are a couple of things I like to do I have my routine you know I go down for a swim come back take the dogs for a walk and then I eat when I get back and that depends you know how early I've done those first two things Mm -hmm. but it's rarely going to be before 10 11 o'clock but yes there is no reason why I couldn't be eating my first meal by say 11 o'clock at the latest and then pulling that evening meal back Mm -hmm. to you know say five o'clock latest but yes my biggest challenge is always just eating that evening meal and stopping no daisy there's no chocolate there's no nuts there's no nut butter there's none of that stuff. (laughs) Yeah. And and I think that goes back to things we've talked about before about mindset and things about, you know, I'm someone who eats two meals or I eat twice a day. Mm. Okay. So I ate at 11 and I'm eating at five. That's my two times. So all of those other things don't fit in my plan. The other thing I think you may notice is as you move your meals a little earlier, you have less likelihood to want to snack. Now, Habit wise, that's a totally different issue. You know, Mm. I'm sitting here, it's nine o'clock at night. What else do I do besides Mm. reach into the bag and start eating some nuts? But physiologically, I find that people are much less tempted to snack when they get all of their food in earlier in the day. It's the dragging it late that keeps that eating mode going. 
Yes, because if you take that hunger element away and all you're left with is a habit, and I say all quite forcefully because it is quite a big thing. But yes, it's one less thing to have to deal with, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And then the last thing I would say about the kind of mix of things you hear, what you heard her say that might have sounded a little bit contradictory or the things that I'm saying, I think with any concept like this, you can think of it with financial things, you can think of it with exercise things, there's always like a continuum from the least helpful to the most helpful. Mm. And most of us have to find ourselves somewhere on that continuum. And so when you hear someone talking about this to the general public, where most of us are eating however many times a day, however many times our hand finds food, just changing it to the 14 hours is already a big change. Yes, exactly. Mm. Whereas, you know, you and I have been in this world for a while of getting used to eating two meals a day, some days one meal or something. And so when they say 14 hours, that doesn't sound like much to us anymore. Yeah. And they were even like 12 to 14 yeah. hours. I'm like, 12? I mean, yeah. you know, come on. <laughs> but be, think about what that means. For most people, that means mm. you are not going to snack after your last meal. Mm. That's huge. If nothing else, if people only cut out their evening snacking, many people would see a lot of change. And Sachin Panda in some of the episodes that I've listened to him talk about, he influenced his mom who is in India. He influenced her to limit her food to just 10 hours of the day. So she was basically fasting for 14. Her diabetes improved or I'm not, I can't remember if she was diabetic, but her metabolic health improved. She lost weight and that was the only change she made. Mm. So again, I think sometimes when you and I hear experts like this, we are already using a little bit different measure. And so then you can take that information and narrow it down even more. If you're into a place of optimizing your health even more, then shifting earlier in the day, even better than keeping the same meals later in the day. Mm. Just ways to keep tweaking based on this broad scope of information. And just bringing that mindset piece into it, and it's a very good point. And I've heard you talking about this before, when you're tying it with identity and where you just said just there, you know, I am a person who eats two meals a day. And I've heard you saying, you know, I'm a person who doesn't snack. I eat at my meal times. <laughs> that is when I eat food and I do not eat food unless it's at a meal time. Mm -hmm. You know, Megan talks about this and she said, you, you don't necessarily have to you know, cut out these demon foods, you know, a lot of foods get demonized, cheese, nuts, you know, these kind of things. And maybe they are things that you have to mm -hmm. think about restricting from your diet for a number of reasons. But just by moving them to your meal times only could make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. So that's certainly something that I really want to make my next big thing that becomes absolutely my normal, absolutely my identity. I only eat at meal times and I eat twice a day mm -hmm. because I think it will make a huge difference. And if you're going to eat some nuts, they are with your meal. Exactly. They are part of your meal. They're not added to your meal, but they are part of the meal. Because so many of the foods that we want to eat outside of meal times, either they just don't belong in our nutritional plan or they could be part of the meal. Yes, you know, they're dessert yeah. or whatever, you know, starter. It's the fact that they're being eaten outside of the meal time is the problem. Yes, exactly. And I think for some people, that will be an easier thing, at least to start with, if they're starting to think about foods that they need to not eat for a while, mm -hmm. you know, to actually make the first step, especially if they are these things that they're mm -hmm. eating outside meals, to make the first step that you only eat them at meal times, mm -hmm. And then we'll see what happens. You know, maybe you won't have to cut them out. That's right. Well, this has been very interesting as always, it, like I say, to a lot of people, it will sound like a very simple thing, but how many people out there needed this reminder? <laughs> I know I did. <laughs> so I'm sure there will be other people out there who did too. Absolutely. 
Now, you know very well by now, Terry, (laughs) she's making that face again. (laughs) Please, can you leave us with a top tip? Fortunately, you've changed it to one top tip. I used to always think I had to have three top tips. I don't know where you got that idea from. (laughs) I don't know. My top tip. I'm going to repeat what you just said and highlighted so well. My top tip is maybe before you think too much about restricting everything and feeling like everything is going to be a deprivation to do this, to really just think about if there's a food that fits your approach to eating, have it with your meal so that you don't have it an hour later, two hours later, four hours later. It's either part of the meal or you don't have it. And I know I sound a little bit like a stickler when I say that, but I think for most of us, we need it to be pretty black and white. If you're going to have nuts, they're part of your meal. It's the word snack that I think is so detrimental to us because even in the keto world, I hear people say, I know, but they're keto snacks. Mm. Or other people might say, it's a healthy snack. It's another time that your body is having to go into digestion. It's another time that you're releasing insulin. It's not healthy. So focus on meals. If there are foods that you want to keep, They're part of the meal. If they don't come at the meal, they don't come. Yes, I absolutely agree. I think it is something that we need to be black and white about. And that's why I wanted to record this episode. And it is something I'm certainly not on my high horse about because it is something that I need to implement. It's something, well, I'm not even in denial about it. I know full well I shouldn't be doing it and I carry on doing it. So I am determined to put it into practice. So I will be interested to see, especially shifting that eating window forward a bit to see if it does have a knock-on effect on appetite in the evening. So yes. Great. Thank you very much. Absolutely. It was so good to be here with you again, Daisy. It was a great pleasure. Thank you very much, Terry. Thank you for staying with me right to the end and I hope you enjoyed that and found it as useful as I did. For this week's end quote I thought we'd stay in the same ballpark and so I found a quote from Sachin Panda. If you eat late at night or start breakfast at a wildly different time each morning you are constantly throwing your body out of sync. Don't worry, the fix is equally simple. Just set an eating routine and stick to it. Timing is everything. And I have to say, personally, as much as I might rebel against any kind of schedule, any kind of routine, I'm sure you've heard me talking about Gretchen Rubin and her tendencies, and I'm very much a rebel and a questioner, but for all that... When I do adopt a routine, I tend to do better. So I kind of have to find ways to nudge myself towards that. And certainly the routine I have at the moment of a nice bracing dip in the sea, taking the dogs out, coming back and having my breakfast and then getting on with my day has turned out to be much more productive than my rather haphazard schedule of the past. So I certainly feel like I'm heading in the right direction. But as you would have heard us talking about, there's certainly a huge amount of room for improvement. And I'm working on bringing that last meal of the day forward a bit. It is, of course, easier said than done. But as with a lot of things that are worth doing, it's worth, I think, working on making it my norm. So there we are. That's another week. I do hope that wherever you are, you are heading into the most wonderful weekend that will set you up for a fabulous week. Until next time, please take very good care and I'll see you soon. Bye bye, Kito lovelies. (music) 